All right. Thank you very much. The one minute of casual glancing involved a lot of talking. I'm looking at you guys. Just kidding. Uh, so up next, we've got Ben Dickerai from All Zero. Thank you very much. Thanks. You look fantastic from up here. Oh my god. You're amazing. I love the amount of purple in the audience as well. So my name is Ben. Our previous speaker has probably already drilled into you that you need to now double check the fact that my name is Ben. Um, I don't actually have a slide telling you who I am, therefore there's no photo in here that I could have put in myself to verify that. <laughs> Which I would have put in my, oh, it's not working. Anyway, my name is Ben. Um, it says so on my badge, must be true. Um, and I want to talk to you today about um, identity, the history of identity, where we came from, um, why we have the technologies and tools we have nowadays, and give you a bit more of an understanding um, about the flows, the, the communications that happen between systems to make that identity and authentication happen. Because maybe when we understand that a bit better, we can see how that closes security holes and why we should do things in certain ways. So where did it start? Who remembers this? Social media is a fantastic tool for social engineering as well. But it, for many other reasons, social engineering is a fantastic tool. But only when there's sufficient mass of people on there for it to be social. Otherwise, it's just a loner's media. So when Facebook first started, and I'm picking on Facebook here, but LinkedIn did it as well. I'm sure a whole lot of other social media providers did it as well. They needed a way to quickly ramp up the number of people in their network. So they had this friend finder system, which is great. You just type in the email address and password for your email address into the page hosted by Facebook. That's OK, isn't it? I think we can agree that that's OK. So behind the scenes, what was going on? Let's have a quick delve down. It's not that complicated. You've got your credentials over there. That's the username and password for your email account. This is Facebook over here, or Twitter, or MySpace, or whichever system it was back in those days. I pick on MySpace because they closed down when um, better. They're still going, actually, aren't they? Does anybody, is anybody here still on MySpace? I'm putting my hand up to encourage you to, but I'm not. <laughs> so you've got your credentials, and you send them to Facebook. Facebook will then get in touch with your email provider and send those credentials into the email provider. Given that we're talking about the 2000s here, more than 10 years ago, we can assume that the API for connecting to your email provider was top notch, REST based, followed all the best practices. No, there was probably actually a screen scraper. So they would go in and they pretend to be a browser, they type in your username and password, and then they would programmatically click on the list of contacts that you had, and they would grab all your contacts and send them back to their own server. And then here's the best part. Not only have they just logged in as you, they now use the email server to actually send the emails. They don't send the emails themselves. So have you ever had one of those emails saying, hey, Ben's on Facebook, and he would like you to join his network because we know your friends. That was actually sent from me using my email provider. It wasn't even from Facebook, which was good in a number of ways because it got around a whole lot of spam issues because we don't want this to be caught as spam, because it's not spam, right? Now, any developer worth their salt at this point would say, you know what, we've got the list of contacts already, and we've sent them all in, all in email, and we want them all to join our network. But before we like, close this process, this loop up, we're just going to take all those bits of uh, contact information. We'll stick them in the database anyway. They haven't signed up to our account. They haven't agreed to our terms and conditions. But we'll put it in there, because the later on when they do sign up, we'll already know who their friends are. That'll make our lives so much easier. So notwithstanding the huge privacy cringes that you're all hopefully feeling right at this very moment, the real what the is that part over there where the credentials are sent to Facebook. And I think we'll probably all agree with the fact that this was a very bad idea. We'll probably agree that it was a good idea from a business development and promotion and marketing perspective, and there was a good way of getting their system off the ground. But the implementation was shit. So OAuth was born. OAuth is an uh, authorization protocol. So it allows you to say that something is allowed to do something on somebody else's behalf. This is what they wanted. Facebook wanted to be able to get contact details. 
So the way this works is you have your email credentials over here, but rather than sending them to Facebook, you would send a request to Facebook saying, I want you to find all my friends for me and send them messages to, to get them to join. Um, can you make some kind of connection to my email provider? So a redirect would be then sent back. So you would then be redirected to your email provider. At the moment, your credentials are still only in your head or in your browser. Your email provider would then potentially ask you to log in. So you might send your credentials over. You might already be logged in. And then you'll get that familiar screen you've probably all seen saying, this system wants to be able to access this information. Do you allow it? So you'd say yes. We'd create some kind of uh, token, which in some way would make its way back to Facebook. And Facebook can then use that token to talk directly to the email provider and do things like getting out the contact details, the, the, the contact list, without having to know the credentials. In an ideal world, it would then send the emails itself. I mean, technically, at this point, maybe it can use the API to send those emails. But in an ideal world, it would send those emails itself, and maybe it would store some of the information to the database. But again, that comes down to the terms and conditions. But at least you've given permission to your email provider to share those contacts with the social media provider that you're using. So the kind of things that authorization does, it allows you to do things like LinkedIn can read emails on Gmail. That's a useful authorization thing to do. Uh, TweetDeck can post tweets on, tweets on Twitter. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Or Eventbrite can create events on Facebook. These are things that a lot of us will probably already have permission set up for, and we're, we're familiar with that kind of uh, authorization uh, concept. On top of this, providers then thought to themselves, well, we actually need, it would be useful to us, not need. Things are never need, they're always useful usually around marketing and making more money. We, we would like a way to do something like Eventbrite can get Ben's details from Twitter. Is there some way we can actually use Ben's identity to manifest our own version of Ben in our system without him having to give us a username or password in the first place? But Auth didn't provide that because it's only an authorization protocol, not an authentication protocol. So various groups, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, a couple of these others got together and worked out that there was a way to do this. Get, if we go back to the previous slide, we've got read, post, create. They're all nice verbs. Get is a very generic verb. It's not a very nice verb, but they thought it's still a verb. So we'll come up with this thing called user info. So user info is an endpoint that's provided by a lot of identity providers so that it is a thing that you can do and you can get that identity and then you can use that identity to manifest that user in your system. So you can onboard a user into your application without having to worry about logins and passwords and password reminders and single sign-on and login with Google. Well, this is login with Google, essentially. So I've already described how there was this real shambolic way of sending information around. I want to get contacts, and you know, it's probably going to come back in some kind of XML format, or maybe it's a vCard format, who knows. They layered on top of this an extra API called user info. So you would send through the same token to that user info endpoint. And that token would then allow the, the uh, Facebook, in this example, to talk to Google, in this example, to retrieve a whole load of information about the user. Now, the problem at this point is that it was a great idea. It enabled this uh, authentication process through an authorization layer. But there was no standard around it. It was really complex to add another identity provider into your suite of who can people log in with to get access to my system. The endpoint there, slash user info, wasn't always user info. Sometimes it was slash profile slash something. The, the, the endpoint would be totally uh, down to the provider, the identity provider itself. The format that the information came back in could be XML, could be CSV, could be JSON, could be I don't know, some kind of really badly formatted English, which is, as we all know, is really concise and easy to understand and machine readable. Th there was no standard around that. So this is where OpenID Connect came in. I tried to find a succinct way of describing what the goal of OpenID Connect was, and I found a seven paragraph document, which I'll show you, no, I won't show you that now. What I'll show you is the six main uh, key points that OpenID was the, the design decisions around OpenID were supposed to meet. So primarily, it needed to be an identity layer. Its sole purpose is to provide some kind of understanding of identity of 
a system or an entity within the communications process. In this case, the person who's trying to log in. It needs to sit on top of OAuth 2. We already had a really good protocol that was implemented in many places already for this authorization to happen. There was no point in re-implementing again another way of doing exactly the same thing, but for a, a different data set. So OpenID Connect sits on top of uh, OAuth 2. It cannot exist without OAuth 2. It, it will verify the identity. So if you get an identity back, it's not just a, a random identity, like you could go to uh, Facebook and type in some random username and you'll find information about Joe Bloggs who lives down the street. But we, we need something that's a verifiable identity. This information we're getting back is coming back from an identity provider about the person who has currently got a session with us. It's a verified identity. Ideally, we want to get a bit of extra profile information. At its very core, an identity in Facebook is that long digit number that represents your identity in the, in the system. It's like a, a unique identifier, uh, UUID in some systems, but it doesn't help us. So a bit of extra profile information. Can we get their name, their email address? Ideally, we want it to be in a REST, well, not ideally. It needs to be in a REST-based uh, manner and interoperable because REST is totally interoperable. We all love REST. There's nothing wrong with REST, is there? I'm picking on REST a little bit. It's all right. Um, and finally, using JSON as a data format. Because JSON is something that is easy to consume but flexible enough for you to put in whatever data you want, it means that we can have some definitions and guidelines around the kind of information that you can expect while still allowing developers and identity providers to expand the amount of information that's returned to provide additional utility to the developer. So normally identity might be like the first name and the last name and an email address, but potentially we can also add extra bits of information in there like this person is an administrator within our system or this person uh, is allowed to access this area of um, uh, a dashboard. So not necessarily a perfect place to put this kind of access control, but you could. Various other bits of information you could add in there are uh, memberships, mem the memberships of uh, organizational units within an LDAP account, which will then allow your application to change the features and functionality that are available to the user. But the fact is, because it's JSON, you can put whatever, the, whatever you like in there. I'm very conscious this is being recorded. So OpenID Connect, how does it work? Uh, within the OpenID Connect uh, and OAuth space, there's a concept of a, a client and a provider. And this can get confusing because for a lot of us, a client might be the web browser represented by the face in a circle. Uh, in this case, the client within the identity provider kind of model, the, the open ID model, the identity, uh, the, the client rather is your application and the provider is the identity provider. So when you set up this relationship to start with, you have to obviously tell the identity provider you have this application that wants to be able to use OpenID Connect in order to authenticate and authorize a person within your system. You'll be given two key bits of information, the client ID and the client secret, represented by those two little dots at the top there, if you can see them. The client ID is an identifier. It's to all, extent, to all intents and purposes something that can be shared publicly. It doesn't need to be, but it doesn't hurt if it gets let out. A client secret, as the name implies, is a secret. So you don't share that except with the identity provider in order to prove that you are the client who is talking. So, user comes along to Facebook, for example, and says, I want to log in with LinkedIn. I don't even know if Facebook does that. Why would they? You go along to, um, I don't know, abc.com. I think that's like a US news outlet or something. Say, for example, they've got a login mechanism and they say, I want to log in with Facebook. So what they do is they send a redirect with the client ID back to your browser, which causes the redirect to end up on the identity provider. The identity provider now has the client ID, so it knows that it's somebody trying to log into abc.com. They can do whatever kind of branding, stick a logo on there, they know which database to look in for the users, and they can then show the login page, which is served from the identity provider, not from abc.com. The user then logs into the system, providing credentials directly back to the identity provider, and the identity provider can then look up in their database to work out whether or not the person's supposed to be able to log in. Let's assume they are. So it'll then create a token or a, an, auth, an auth code, which gets sent back to the browser. This auth code has no real link to you as the person logging in, except for the fact that the identity provider knows for a certain period of time this auth code was generated for them. 
But the idea is that if anybody else gets that auth code, they can't do anything with it. The auth code is then, uh, so that's a, a redirect that comes back to the identity, identity provider in order, to, in order to push the auth code into your application. Your application can then take the secret and the auth code, so it's now saying, I am the client who requested this person's login. Here's the proof, here's the secret, and also here's an auth code I got. Can you tell me more about the user? The identity provider can then take that auth code, verify the, the client, uh, client secret, of course, take the auth code, convert that into the user that just logged in, create another token, and then return that token back to your application. So that would typically be on a, an identity token. You can also have access tokens, which would allow your application to talk to other APIs uh, on my behalf. I gave you a spoiler. And those tokens are JSON web tokens, predominantly. So when you're looking at access tokens, you can still get opaque tokens, which is possibly what a lot of you are familiar with, which are like the 30, 40 character randomish strings that you would pass as a bearer token to uh, an API in order to authenticate your access to that API. When it comes to um, uh, identity providers providing access tokens for talking to other systems within that ecosystem that you've created, that you've configured, you've got an API, you've got, for example, a single page app, I'm logged into the single page app, but the app needs to be able to talk to the API with a token that represents me. That would be a JSON web token in a lot of cases. JSON web tokens look like this. Any questions? Okay, I'll, I've, I'll color code it slightly, although on this screen, this yellow looks a bit like that yellow, which I think is actually supposed to be green. Psh, who knows? But you can see the two white dots there. So a JSON web token is three bits of information. You've got the header, the payload, and the signature. The header the, and the payload are both base64 URL encoded, and you can decode those, and they're human readable once decoded, unless anybody here has got a in-the-head decoder. No, I'm, I'm still working on mine. Once you decode those, you get bits of information like the header and the payload in JSON, which you can now rely on, because the signature will give you that reliance, that, that assurance that the data hasn't been modified. You can rely on this information to make decisions in your application. My favorite here is the type. When you look at a JSON web token, the header will tell you the type is a JSON web token, which I only knew because I assumed it was a JSON web token, so decoded it as a JSON web token to find out that it was actually a JSON web token. Moving on. <laughs> so the signature down here, you can see that string there, we're asserting that if you take the header and the payload and you munge them together and you take some kind of password or a pre-shared key, and then the outcome of your operation to create that, key, that signature will match the signature in the JSON web token. If those match, you know the payload and the header haven't been modified. Or somebody found a very narrow collision, which I don't think has happened. Uh, and access tokens, similarly, will provide information in JSON, but they give you different bits of information. So we know that the issuer of this token uh, was a certain identity provider. We know the subject of the person who logged in, and that subject will never change. Whenever I log in in the future with that same identity, it'll always be exactly the same. So you can rely on that as an API consuming this token to know who it is who's making a request on the API endpoints. But where can you go from here? So imagine you've got complex systems, most of us work on complex systems, even simple systems turn out to be complex. But imagine you've got this complex system with lines everywhere, and imagine that the orange lines are the login and the authentication are the, yes, authentication or identity bits of information. In a lot of mechanisms, you'd be having to send this information around to multiple places, and your system architecture would have to have some way of storing that identity uh, and managing things like password changes. But if you use something like uh, an OAuth and OpenID provider as your identity manager, whether that's something you host internally, you can get off-the-shelf solutions, open source and proprietary, or you can go to cloud providers, or you can go straight to some of the social networks that have the login with type mechanisms. You can extract all of this, or uh, containerize all this. Uh, I shouldn't use containerize, because this isn't a Kubernetes talk. Um, you can uh, consolidate all of this functionality around identity into one place, not have to worry about it so much if you're Hosting it internally, obviously, that's a different question. Um, but you can, you can put all that into one place. And then you've got these tokens that you can just pass around willy-nilly. Because the token by itself isn't going to do anything. There's no harm in sharing a token. 
uh, when you are, if you are ever on the side of creating the payload content, make sure you don't put anything sensitive in there like passwords, because remember that even if the signature is invalid, somebody can still read the payload. And then you can even use the token within mobile apps via your internal APIs to get access to systems as well. So you're looking at native and web applications. They can all make use of these tokens to manage identity and authentication. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, an insight into how you can simplify that aspect. Uh, none of us write, actually, hands up, unless you work for Pushpay. <laughs> hands up if you work for a company that does um, merchant credit card processing. OK. So hands up if you've ever written uh, your own merchant processing code and you don't work for someone like Pushpay. Fewer hands. Hands up if you've written your own login page. You see the disparity there? So don't do, don't do what doesn't make you special. Writing a login page doesn't make your product special. I don't mean to say you're not special. You're all special to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the most special of snowflakes. But don't work on creating a better login page when you could be spending that time making the product that you provide for your customers and your clients, or whether they're internal or external. If you can make that product better, you're doing more for your project or your product than you could be by making identity and authorization better, because that's a solved problem. Use an off-the-shelf solution for that. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to take questions and stuff in the networking afterwards. I also, if anybody's done their fingernails, I've got some decals you can stick on there that I'll be getting out, um, and stickers and all sorts, so come grab me. Thanks for your time.